So yeah, I'm Chris Demuth from Lancaster University. Um, I'm gonna give two apologies before I start. So the first is that I'm kind of getting over a cold, so my voice is a bit crap. So I apologize about that. I have to say crap and it's recorded, so I feel bad for that. Um, so if I don't say anything correctly, then just ask me at the end to clarify some things. Uh, the second caveat is that this is brand new work. Um, we put the paper on archive um, a month ago, and so there's an archive preprint there if you want to have a look. But the slides are brand new. They're, they're so fresh that the paint's still drying on them. I think I finished about five minutes ago. Um, and as Alan was saying, most of the work that I've done previously in this sort of Bayesian sampling world is mostly MCMC. So Markov chain Monte Carlo, that's kind of my main area. And this stuff is a little bit different, moving in a slightly different direction. So um, what Louis and I have been working on with these sort of learning rate free ideas, it's essentially taking some ideas from the sort of optimization world and then trying to bring those into the sort of sampling world. And so it's quite new for us. We think it's quite interesting. And so hopefully you'll find it interesting as well. So what's the setup of the problem we're trying to solve? So this is a very typical sort of Bayesian problem where we have some distribution, pi or with density pi x. And we're going to define that in this form where we assume that u is some sort of potential function and z is some normalizing constant. So if you're in a sort of Bayesian setting, then this potential function u would be like your sort of log likelihood plus your log prior, okay? And when we want to try and approximate these sort of distributions in high dimensions, um, what we tend to do is um, we use some sort of numerical scheme like Markov chain Monte Carlo type algorithms. So we run a Markov chain where we can show that if we run this algorithm for long enough, like Metropolis Hastings or something, or sort of uh, stochastic versions like stochastic gradient laundering dynamics, if you run these things for long enough, you can sort of show that either you'll sort of converge to the true distribution or you'll converge closely enough with some error, either sort of Monte Carlo error or maybe error with some bias. If you're using some sort of like stochastic gradient type methods, they're not exact, but you can sort of quantify the error in some sort of Wasserstein distance sort of sense. Um, but instead of using sort of simulation-based approaches, the other perspective you could take is more of a sort of optimization type perspective where you would have, say, variational inference or the plus approximations where what you're essentially trying to do is trying to solve an optimization problem by minimizing some divergence, say, between your true distribution and, say, a Gaussian, for example. But then somewhere kind of in the middle between these two ideas, you have these sort of like particle-based methods um, where if you imagine sort of like very old traditional variational inference where you say I've got some posterior distribution and I've got some Gaussian that I want to approximate it by, how do I estimate the parameters of this Gaussian such that they minimize the KL divergence between the Gaussian and the posterior? That you can sort of use an optimization problem, but you've decided that you're going to approximate your distribution with some sort of Gaussian. Now, with these sort of particle-based approaches, they try to relax that assumption by using something non-parametric where you would say, instead, I've got some particles or some samples, let's say, and I want to manipulate these particles in such a way that they will closely approximate this posterior distribution. So um, the idea behind this talk is to sort of think about this sort of connection between sampling and optimization uh, methods, which has become quite popular these sort of last few years. And the way we sort of bring those two ideas together is, um, to sort of think about doing optimization on this sort of space of probability measures, okay? So if pi is some sort of target distribution that we want to try to approximate, then what we're looking for is we're looking for the sort of distribution, let's say, which minimizes some functional, okay? And for the purpose of this talk, mostly we're going to think about this functional as being a callback Leibler divergence, okay? So what sort of measures can we choose such that we will minimize this divergence? Okay. And what we're going to see is that you can't usually sort of minimize um, this sort of functional in a sort of continuous time setting. So what you would tend to do is you discretize it in some way. And this gives you a discretization of something that's called gradient flow. And depending on how you do this discretization to minimize this functional, Depending on how you do it, you can end up with a whole bunch of different algorithms. So Longevin, Monte Carlo is quite a popular algorithm. And that just comes from assuming this functional F is your KL. When you do the sort of discretization, if you discretize that under a quadratic Wasserstein metric, then you end up with Longevin, Monte Carlo algorithm. If you do the discretization again, but now this time you do it using a kernelized Wasserstein metric, then you end up with this 
rather popular algorithm now called the Stein variational gradient descent algorithm. Okay, so the, there are already quite a few, I mean, these are just two of them, but there are many, many more algorithms which are also trying to solve this sort of same sort of problem. How do we sort of minimize this functional? And once we then try to implement this as a sampling scheme or an optimization scheme and try to use it in practice, you then have to do some type of discretization and that gives you a whole bunch of different algorithms which you can use. So these um, sort of particle-based variational inference methods, sometimes called PARVs, um, have this sort of following form. We assume we have some particles from some empirical measure of U. Okay? So you just take some particles, which call x1 up to xn. These could be samples from, say, Gaussian distribution, let's say. And what I want to do is I want to transport these particles so that this initial distribution that I have will converge, in some sense, to the true distribution that I care about. So, you know, you can simulate from some Gaussian and I want to move these particles so that eventually they'll converge to the approximations from my posterior distribution, let's say. And when we do that is we define this transport map. So we take our particles and we move them in some fashion where gamma is going to be, say, a step size, or we might, we might call this a learning rate. And phi is this sort of perturbation direction to how we're going to move these particles. And there are lots of different choices for how we define phi to be, but one of the most popular ones is to choose phi such that you will maximally decrease the KL divergence. Okay, so that's basically this thing here. And this is exactly what you get with the Stein variational brain descent approach. So when that paper came along in 2016, this was exactly what they were trying to do. They were trying to create an update scheme such that you will in each iteration be minimizing your KL divergence. So what we have here is the KL between the posterior or density that we care about pi and T mu is the transport map that's applied to the um, probability measure mu. Okay, So mu is our empirical measure, T mu is applied the map to mu. And then what we have is some sort of update which looks a bit like this, where you take those particles, you apply the map, you get out some new particles, which then gives you a sort of push forward measure going from say mu at iteration T to iteration T plus one. And then this H is some normed function space, which later on we'll just use as an RKHS, okay? And so the idea of these methods is you choose some particles and you keep pushing, pushing, pushing them until eventually they converge to something which looks like your posterior distribution. So just to give you a, if I've got this right, yeah, just to give you an illustration of what this looks like. This is a simulation of um, the stochastic gradient, st Stein variational gradient descent algorithm. And what you're seeing here are um, nine bivariate Gaussians. Okay, this is what these circles are here. And we initialize the algorithm by just choosing some particles, the red dots, which we initialize sort of in the middle here, it's sort of zero, zero. And then once we run this algorithm, and I'll go into more details later on about what the algorithm is, but once we run this SVGD algorithm, you sort of see that the particles kind of repel each other, they sort of move apart, and then they explore other modes of the distribution. And then within there, they sort of like move themselves apart to kind of give like a good sort of like a covering, let's say, of the mode. Now, it's not perfect. You'll notice that so this mode down here in the sort of bottom left doesn't sort of get captured until sort of the very last minute. One particle kind of jumps over from sort of one side to the other. Um, and then on the right hand side, you, you sort of see this contour plot that's evolving with number of iterations. Um, but what's nice about these sorts of algorithms is that they're really easy to code up. Um, all you require is the ability to calculate the uh, gradient of the potential function. So if you're thinking about a posterior distribution, if you can get the gradient of your log posterior, then you can just plug that into this um, algorithm, which looks a bit like a sort of um, variation on gradient descent. You just plug that in, let it run, and you get quite a good empirical approximation of your distribution. So it's simple to use, which is great. Um, it also has the nice advantage compared to standard variational methods that we don't need to assume some sort of base distribution, uh, which falls into a par parametric family like a Gaussian, for example. So obviously we see here the approximation is clearly non-Gaussian. Now, if we chose our variational family to be just Gaussians, then we'd never be able to capture these other modes. So having this sort of non-parametric aspect does allow you to kind of explore these other modes. 
So that's kind of how these sort of Parvi algorithms work. There are all sorts of different variations. Um, I'll talk a little bit about, about some of them sort of later on, but that's the general intuition of what you're trying to do. You're sort of trying to create a sampling algorithm. So you get these sort of samples and particles, but the way you update them feels a bit more like an optimization algorithm. Okay, so the title of my um, talk was coin sampling. So what I'm going to do in the talk is I'm going to show how you can go from something which looks a bit like this. I say a bit like this in inverted commas because this is not really the kind of algorithm you would ever run, but just for illustrative purposes, you have um, Stein variation or gradient descent and, and these other sorts of similar methods that all have updates that look a bit like this, which is your sort of like standard um, optimization gradient descent kind of updates where you take your x or the particles uh, time t minus one and you update them by moving them in the direction that minimizes some divergence let's say combat libel divergence okay so that's kind of what the svgd algorithm looks like except you replace this gradient of the functional with something else but what we have here and this is the fundamental part of the talk is that we have a learning rate or step size parameter which is called gamma and we want to get rid of that. And what we're going to do is we're going to create this new algorithm, which we're going to call coin parvi or coin SVGD. And it has a very different functional form. So we still have the same kind of updates. Okay, we're still moving from say x at t minus one to xt. But now when we make this move, the update is still quite simple. Um, we have the same tools in here. We still have the gradient of this functional. We have xs, so that's f, that's x, sorry, at iteration s. So s runs from one up to t minus one. Okay. So we have this sort of like summation of these um, gradient terms. And this is just the inner product of the gradient and um, the particles at that point. And t little t is the iteration number that we're up to so far. So x so far that xt. But what you notice from this is that there's no learning rate. Okay, so we've managed to get rid of this gamma, and gamma no longer applies, but instead we do have this capital L, and this capital L is then a bound on the gradient. So if we know what that is, that's great, we just plug this in and off we go. If we don't know what that is, then we can sort of learn that on the fly, and we'll talk a little bit about that sort of later on. But what I really want to try and highlight now at this early stage of the talk is that what we're aiming for is we're going to go from something which looks a bit like standard gradient descent to something which looks a bit weird, but it gets us away from having any learning rates. Okay, and the way we're going to do that is by using these ideas from um, convex optimization, um, which are called coin betting algorithms. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk a little bit about how everything works in the sort of convex optimization setting, how you get these sort of coin betting algorithms, and then I'm going to take those ideas and I'm basically going to steal them and plug them into my sort of um, Wasserstein space that I'm actually working with instead when I'm in this sort of Parvi sort of framework. Okay, and that's that's why you know, we're sort of going from this to this essentially. Okay, so how does optimization work in Euclidean spaces? So assume that we want to minimize some function whatever that may be. Um, in this case, I'm going to assume that this function is strongly convex. And then what we're going to do in order to find the sort of value which minimizes, minimizes this function, we're going to apply what we call gradient flow. Okay, so you sort of see, imagine this as like a continuous time um, updating scheme that's going to move from sort of initial value down to X star, which is your minimal value. And the way we do that is by following this sort of differential inclusion. Okay, now, we never actually implement this thing in continuous time because it's just not how sort of computers work and it doesn't wouldn't work into the general setting of uh, many forms of F anyway. So what we would do in practice is we'd do a discretization. Okay, so the different types of discretizations, sort of the forward Euler discretization is probably the most popular, but there are a whole bunch of other ones as well you could choose. And if you do this sort of discretization of this gradient flow step, then what you end up with is the sort of standard um, gradient descent algorithm, which you've probably seen before. So going from um, running the algorithm for say t iterations, going from xt to xt plus one, we're moving x in the direction of the gradient of negative gradient. Okay, so we find the minimum of this function. So gt is just now element of this gradient. This is subgradient. And again, we have this gamma, which is going to be our learning rate. Okay. And the 
question um, faced with all these optimization algorithms is always how do you choose gamma? And there's been a lot of research in the optimization world to decide how you can optimally find gamma or how you can do some adaptive schemes like Adam and Adagrad um, to try to sort of um, estimate or approximate learn or get around using these things sort of on the fly. So one of the sort of well-known results, of the many well-known results um, in the convex optimization literature, but one which relates to what we're going to be talking about is this idea of, well, what is the optimal learning rate? So if we assume that L is, uh, sorry, assuming our function is L Lipschitz, and we want to know what happens to the average of our iterates. So as we run this gradient descent algorithm, if we take the average, um, what, what is that actually going to look like? So the function of that, um, the average value um, minus f of x star, so x star is the minimum, we can upper bound that error by a term of this form. So this comes from this paper here. And once you have this, what you can say is, well, now I know I've got this upper bound, I can just choose my ideal or optimal learning rate to have this form, okay? And if I have this particular learning rate, then I can just take this learning rate, plug it back into here, and I now have this error rate, okay? So my error is um, determined by L, which is my Lipschitz constant, is determined by X1, so where I initialize the algorithm from, X star, where I, to the point I converge to, and root T, um, so T being the number of iterations. So this will tell you that using this optimal learning rate, we get this sort of one over root T type convergence, okay? But the problem, of course, is that you can never actually use this in practice, because in order to use this in practice, we need to know what this, um, this, this norm will be between x1 and x star. Okay, we know x1, that's fine, but we never know what x star is a priori. Okay, so can we get around this? Is there a way of running these sort of gradient algorithms without learning rates? So this is where sort of coin betting comes in. So imagine you have a gambler, okay, and you have an adversarial coin. Now, you start off with some wealth at time zero, which I'm going to call W naught. And what we're going to do is every iteration, the gambler is going to bet on the outcome of a coin flip. Okay, so the coin's either heads or tails. So the coin is going to be plus one, which means it's heads, or minus one, which means tails. Okay, and we're going to make a bet, and the bet is going to be X. Okay, and that's going to be a real number value between plus and minus infinity. And the sign of that is going to determine whether or not we bet on a heads or we bet on a tails, okay? So if X is a positive number, we're basically betting on heads. If X is a negative number, we're essentially betting on tails, okay? And then the absolute value of XT then tells you the sort of size of the bet that we're making, okay? So if we bet, say, 10 pounds, then we're betting 10 pounds on heads. If we bet negative 10, then we're betting... 10 pounds on tails, okay? So then at the teeth iteration of this game, what will happen is if we bet, say X equals 10, we bet 10 pounds on heads, so this is positive. C is also positive because it's heads, then we'll win, okay? So if the signs match, then you win. If, however, we bet uh, 10 pounds, so plus 10, but it came up tails, then this is negative one, then that's how much we lose, we're gonna lose. 10 pounds, okay? So the size of X tells you how much we bet, but the sign tells you whether we're betting on heads or tails, okay? Now, we can record our wealth if we play this game through time. So we start at time zero and we make a bet. Um, we see what happens, do we win or lose? And we just accumulate all of these results. And the final wealth that we have at time T will just be this summation. Okay, that's quite straightforward. Now, when we choose how much we're going to bet, we're going to put in a bit of a restriction. We're going to assume that the amount we bet is a proportion of our current wealth. So this is our wealth at time T minus one. And I'm gonna bet some value beta, which is going to be between plus and minus one. Remembering that if beta is sort of positive, then we're betting on um, heads. If beta is negative, then we're betting on tails. Okay, so we're always going to bet some fraction of our wealth. Okay. So the question then becomes, well, what should beta be? 
So there are lots of different ways to choose beta. Now, from there's quite a lot of research in economics of how you solve this problem for coin betting, and there's a result known as the Kelly criterion, which tells you that if you know the probability of a head, I call it P, if you know what that is, then you can optimally define what percentage of your wealth you should bet at each iteration. So for example, if P is say 0.6, so 60% chance of a heads, then two times 0.6, that's 1.2, take away the one, that tells you that B, or beta, sorry, should be 0.02. So you should bet 20% of your wealth at every iteration. And you can show through the Kelly criterion that if you follow this scheme, then you end up with something which looks like um, a sort of compound interest type approach where your wealth will just grow exponentially through time. Um, however, we don't know what P is, and we're going to have this sort of situation, which will make more sense a bit later on, where um, the sort of probability of knowing what it's going to be heads or tails is, is going to be unknown. We're going to have this sort of adversarial sort of setting. So we don't know what P is, but you can imagine a situation where you knew all future outcomes. Okay, so from time little time one. T equals one up to time capital T, you know what's going to happen every single iteration. And if you had to bet a fixed fraction of your wealth at any given time, what would it be? And the optimal thing to do would be, well, if you know all the outcomes, all these plus ones and minus ones, then the optimal thing to do would be for your um, strategy just to be to take the average of those, and that will be your beta, okay? And you can show that this is optimal and using this sort of betting strategy is possible via Pinsker's inequality to show that your wealth at time t will be lower bounded by your initial wealth in this sort of exponential term here, okay? But in practice, you never know what the future is. We're playing this game through time um, in sort of like an online, online type setting. So instead, what we would do is, rather than knowing everything, we only know everything up to time t minus one. So we only know everything up to what we've seen so far. So at the next iteration, the best thing we could do is basically sort of take the average of what we've seen so far and use that as our bet for the next iteration. And if you do this, this is known as the krzyzewski trofimov estimator, or what I'll call the KT estimator. And there were some results in, um, I'll cite the paper a little bit later, but there's a paper by, um, Olavona and Pal in Europe, so I think 2016, 2017. Um, and they showed that this estimator is pretty close to the optimal you would have if you knew the, whole, the full future. Okay. So this is what we're going to use um, for our um, sort of proportion of wealth that we're going to bet each iteration. Okay, so that's everything about coin betting. But then of course the question is, what on earth does coin betting have to do with optimization? So how can we use coin betting to optimize functions? Third, can I can just interrupt with a quick yeah. question? Yeah. So th th this reminds me of the uh, exp three uh, bandit algorithm. Uh, yeah. The uh, it pretty much has the same form as a yeah. I think it's a, it's exponentially weighted. Uh, can recall exactly what it stands for the abbreviation, but it's very fairly famous uh, okay. uh, bandit algorithm for adversarial settings. Okay, cool. Yeah, well, I wouldn't be surprised if it has come up in other areas. Um, maybe you could send me that paper because it's not one I'm familiar with because I'm not really a bandit person. Yeah, yeah. I mean, time. it's there is really a lot of now papers uh, after the original one. Yeah. Okay, will do. Um, yeah, so the question is, how do you take this sort of coin back after? Sorry, can I ask a quick question as well? Yeah, so go ahead. Uh, uh, so when you said it's optimal, I presume that's uh, in expectation of some future wealth at some future point in time. Is that, does it change if you consider uh, a variance or risk risk adjusted returns? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I think in the, was, oh gosh, sorry. So I think in this setting it is, as you say, it's an optimal expectation, but I'm not sure actually if it's derived in terms of risk returns, it might. Be, there might be an extension, I think, in, or maybe there is actually, yes. So I think in your bonus paper, I think they do derive it in terms of um, a sort of risk minimization sort of setting, but I can't remember exactly the details of it, I'm afraid. No problem. Thanks. Also, questions? Yeah, one more. Um, so also this, I mean, this, this, all, this assumes that there is like a, a fixed, 
uh, probability that you're just trying to discover, right? Yeah. Which I guess makes sense in the coin betting scenario, but maybe makes less sense in an optimization scenario. Yeah, exactly. So what, well, I'll, I'll mention this in a minute, but what you'll sort of find is that depending on what betting strategy you choose will then determine essentially how efficient your optimization algorithm is going to be. So you, as you say, you can certainly choose um, a betting strategy which is optimal in restricted settings like this, but is not necessarily optimal in the more general setting. Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah. So yeah, the connection between sort of coin betting and the 1D optimization. So on the so right hand side here, I have this function, which is um, x minus 10, absolute value of x minus 10. That's the blue line you sort of see here. And what we're going to do is at each iteration, so you sort of see these black steps that I'm sort of taking here. Um, at each iteration, you're going to bet some number of pounds, some we'll call xt, and I'm going to bet on the outcome of the gradient of this function. So in this instance, the gradient is just going to be plus or minus one, which kind of keeps it close to our sort of coin betting example I had before. And what you'll sort of see is that if we carry on with this assumption where our bets are always some fraction of our wealth, then expanding this term out where we replace this beta t with this sort of kt estimator, um, we then have xt multiplied by this sort of kt estimator multiplied by our previous wealth, and we expand this wealth term out because this is just the wealth at time t minus one is just the wealth at last iteration plus whether or not we won, and so you expand this summation out, and what you'll find is you have something of this form. Now, you might recognize this is exactly what I had earlier on when I said, oh, we're going to take this um, sort of gradient algorithm and we're going to sort of like turn it into a coin version. This is essentially what I had um, at, the, at, the, at the beginning, where W naught is some sort of initial wealth. This is the sort of summation of these gradients that we collect over time. So it's the same here. And Xi is just sort of the current um, iterate at um, iteration i. Okay. And the dynamics of it sort of look a bit like this. So what happens is you're, you make bets. And as, so in this example, it's quite simple because our gradient is just going to be plus or minus one. So we're going downhill, we're heading this way. We're going downhill. So as long as our gradient agrees with the bet that we're making, then our wealth starts accumulating. So we start making bigger and bigger steps. So it has a bit of a feel of these sort of, um, it's not the same, but it has a similar feel to sort of um, acceleration gradient methods that are like Nestor acceleration type methods. So you start to make bigger and bigger steps and eventually you make a step that's too big and you overshoot and your bet no longer matches your gradient. There's now misalignment. And so you pay a heavy penalty and you just have to move back. And that's just because you've, set the game up in such a way that your wealth is accumulating at such a fast rate that you, you, you're you betting a lot of money, it, more and more money every time. And if you make a mistake, it's quite costly. And so you'll go back and then it'll continue again. And the question really is, if you just keep running this thing over and over again, will you ever sort of converge to the minimum? So rather, would the average of these bets converge to some sort of minimum? And there's a result in the Arbonne and Powell paper, which basically looks like this. I've just given it here because it's a quite straightforward couple of steps, um, where what we want to know is if we take the average of these iterates and X star is this sort of, uh, the value, the, the arg min value, then using a few sort of straightforward tricks like Jensen's inequality and the convexity, um, the definition of this function H. So this H is my KT estimator that I had before. This is where all the flexibility it comes in you can choose whatever betting scheme you want but if you use the kt betting scheme then this is the form that your h will take and you just sort of follow these steps through and what really matters is this, this sort of last step here which basically shows you that the error that you get um, from this optimization algorithm is dependent on h which is your um, betting estimator so this is your kt in this case but it could be anything else but what this tells us, and this kind of goes back to the thing Victor sort of asked the question earlier about you know, sort of types of strategies you could choose and what's optimal, what's not optimal. You can sort of see that depending on how you choose your betting strategy will determine um, how fast you're going to converge. Um, so in 
if you sort of look at so the example I just sort of gave them was very much for this sort of very simple um, sort of example where you have sort of one dimensional sort of optimization problem. Um, but if you look at sort of more general sort of L Lipschitz functions, and if you go back to what I said earlier about you know, what's the ideal learning rate, if you knew exactly what the ideal learning rate were and you plugged it in, and this is sort of the optimal um, error that you would get, what they have in the sort of coin betting algorithm, this is the Oliver and Powell paper, what they show is that the um, error is now this form. So it's quite similar. You no longer um, have this sort of dependence on x1, but what you do have instead is you now have this um, root log t. Okay, so this is basically a penalty term, you can imagine it as, because this one at the top here, you got this because you knew exactly what's the optimal learning rate. You no longer have the optimal learning rate, so you are paying a price for that because there's certainly no free lunch. And the price you're paying is this extra root log t um, result. And that was also sort of 1D settings. Then go from this sort of 1D setting where we have these sort of simple gradients of being plus or minus one. We want to then obviously move into the more general setting of like RD. And there are several ways to do this, but in my opinion, the two easiest are if you create this sort of inner product form here. And so taking exactly what we had before, but now we've got this inner product term between the gradient and XI, or you do coordinate wise updates. And it's actually the coordinate wise updates one that we're going to use in a minute when I sort of take all this stuff and then move it into the sort of sampling sort of setting. Um, but then this also assumes that um, this function is uh, one Lipschitz. Um, if you have its L Lipschitz, then you end up with the, sort of the same thing, except that you have to have like a one over L thing here. and um, T gets replaced by LT, for example. So you have to introduce these uh, bounds um, if, if it's not one Lipschitz. Um, okay, so that's sort of how you go from the 1D optimization to sort of the RD optimization. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go into how you sort of take this quite straightforward, really, actually. Once you have that sort of setting of the, sort of the coin betting, once you sort of pick all that up and sort of move it into the Wasserstein setting, it all sort of carries over quite naturally. Um, because now all we're doing is rather than having this sort of um, function f that we, had, that we had before, we're now just replacing this with this functional, which you can sort of imagine as being like this KL divergence type thing. And we're just going to play the exact same game. Okay, Instead of trying to find a point x star that we want to min minimize, we want to try and find this sort of distribution which minimizes this functional. Um, we're going to make very similar assumptions. We're going to assume um, um, geodesic convexity, sort of like moving sort of convexity ideas from the Euclidean space into the Wasserstein space. Um, so it's some similar sort of intuition there. And for most of what we're going to look at, we're just going to assume that F is going to be this sort of KL divergence. You can use all sorts of different divergences, and, and people certainly do. So there are papers where people have looked at these sorts of Wasserstein gradient flow methods where you have, say, chi-squared divergence, or you have uh, MMD, so that's maximum mean discrepancy, or the Kernel-Stein discrepancies, a whole bunch of different ones you can sort of um, choose to use here. And what we found so far is that for most of the common ones that we're aware of, if you replace this F with a KL or a chi squared, you can still create this sort of coin sampling idea, um, irrespective of sort of what um, divergence you choose so far, as far as we know. So before, when we were thinking about optimization, sort of Euclidean space, we're now doing it in this sort of Wasserstein space. And what that kind of looks like is if you imagine mu zero as being a sort of distribution at time zero, we're going to move this distribution, so from mu zero down to mu t, and we're going to move it along this sort of like blue line here. And this is like sort of basically a sort of partial differential equation, so which describes the uh, gradient flow of f. Okay? And of course, we're never actually going to be able to implement, the, implement this in a sort of continuous time setting. So what we're now going to do is we're going to sort of take this sort of gradient flow and we're now going to discretize it in the same sort of way that you do in the Euclidean setting where you do sort of like an Euler discretization. We're going to do the sort of same thing now, but on this uh, functional F, okay? So if you do that, if you do say the forward Euler scheme, there are all sorts of different discretizations you could do. But if you do the forward Euler scheme, then what you have is uh, mu t. So this is your measure at time t. And you have this psi t term, which is the gradient of the functional. And again, gamma is like a learning rate. ID is like an identity map. 
Um, what we're doing here is we're sort of taking what you can imagine as being your particle approximation at time t, and you're mapping it now onto mu at t plus one. So you're sort of you know, going along this sort of curve, but in you know, sort of discrete steps rather than this sort of continuous flow sort of setting. Okay. And a whole bunch of different choices you could choose for F. Um, if you choose F to be um, MMD, maximum mean, maximum mean discrepancy, then you have uh, essentially gradient descent. If you choose it to be the sort of Stein discrepancy, then you have this other type of algorithm, which is in uh, Anna Korber's paper, which I think was in Europe's 2021. And if you sort of take this gradient of your functional and you do some sort of kernelized version of it, then that's what gives you the sort of Stein version or gradient descent algorithm. Um, it's also what gives you this sort of Laplacian adjusted Weissenstein gradient descent. I mean, there's a huge amount of work that's been going on in the last sort of five years or so of um, plugging in different functionals and different types of discretizations. Um, and they all sort of fall under this sort of uh, Weissenstein gradient flow type of umbrella. Um, now, when I talk about, I'll talk about the optimal learning rates in this sort of Euclidean setting, and there's a paper here by Gu, Gao, perhaps Gao, if I pronounce it, um, from last year, and they have a sort of similar result for what is the error when you move um, this sort of problem from being in the sort of Euclidean space into this Wasserstein space. So if you have this sort of, you can sort of imagine this as like an average of your measures over time, the functional functional f of those measures um, from the truth, what you're interested in is pi is your true distribution, then you can upper up bound this error by something of this form. So t is my number of iterations, gamma is again my sort of uh, step size or learning rate parameter. The mu one is the initial measure I started out with, my initial set of particles, let's say, and pi is what I'm targeting, I'm trying to get to. So obviously the, the, the farther away you initialize this thing from, the longer it will take to converge. Um, L is then this um, bound that we have in gradients, T again is iterations, and so that's all straightforward. And what you can show, again, is the same thing we had with the Euclidean case earlier, that you can find some sort of optimal, ideal sort of learning rate, which we call gamma star, and if you take that and plug it into this thing here, then what you'll have now is um, error error rate here, which is, again, one over root T, which is sort of like what we had in the Euclidean flow sense. Um, and then this Wasserstein 2 distance is, again, between sort of how you initialize and where you try to get to. And But again, this is exactly the same sort of story we had earlier with the Euclidean case, where in order to actually figure out what is this ideal learning rate, you basically need to know um, you know, what your, the, the distribution you're trying to target. Because you need to be able to define what this thing is. And so what we're going to try and argue is that you generally don't know what this is, and therefore maybe it'd be nice to try and get rid of these learning rates altogether. So that basically, basically leads us now into sort of coin Wasserstein gradient descent idea. So taking that sort of coin gradient descent stuff that we saw in complex optimization and sort of moving it now into this sort of Wasserstein gradient setting. So I'm just going to go through the sort of steps that we have um, in the algorithm, I think this, we probably presented this slightly rubbishly actually in the paper because all the, this I think is the clearest algorithm that we have. We actually put this in the appendix for space reasons. Um, the, we have a more sort of general form in the main part of the paper, which is the coin Wasserstein gradient using the sort of inner product form of coin. Uh, but I think this one I'm going to show you now is a little bit easier to follow. So you start out with some initial measure, mu1, and you have some. An, sample that you take from that initial measure, call it x1. Um, it could be from the initial measure, it could just be from you know, some RD, let's say, and f, your functional, that's KL or whatever you want that to be. Okay. And we're going to initialize um, these three terms. So L is this upper bound on the gradients, which I'm, uh, if you know that, that's great, just plug that in and just run with it. But if you don't know it, then we're gonna have to try and learn that. G is going to be some uh, summation gradient terms that we're going to collect, and then R is going to be a collection of rewards. So uh, initialize with all these things set to zero. We're going to do the sort of coordinate-wise version of this, so that's why J goes from one to D for each of the coordinates. And as we run this sort of optimization algorithm from iteration one to T, at each iteration, we're going to first of all calculate this negative Wasserstein gradient. Okay, so just take the Wasserstein gradient at the current um, parameter, uh, the current parameter value to xt, we have this slightly interesting notation, which is used quite often in the literature, which is xt um, 
parentheses x1. And what this is basically is trying to highlight is that the measure that you have at time t is dependent on how you initialize from x1, essentially. But you can sort of just imagine this xt, x1 thing as just being xt. Mm -hmm. So we calculate the negative gradient. That's fine. That's our C. So this is like the coin thing we had earlier. This is our coins. And then for each of our dimensions, we're going to record what is the maximum observed bound. Okay. So we initialize this at say zero, but then as we calculate this Wasserstein gradient, we take the absolute value and we're going to store that. And depending on whether that's the maximum we've seen so far, or maybe we've seen one previously, that's the maximum. That's then going to be updated as here is the currently observed maximum that we have so far. We're going to store these absolute gradients as well. Um, so the, these sorts of steps of like storing gradients or squares of gradients, it sort of has a similar feel to what you have with say like Adograd or Adam um, type algorithms. We then have a reward function. So we take our reward from last iteration and then if we get a reward basically if we're going in the right direction if our bets match the direction of movement. And then once we have these three components, then we update the parameter. So x1 is how we initialized, where we initialized from, and we have a summation of our gradients, which is very similar to what we had sort of earlier on. Um, what we have on the denominator term here, you can sort of imagine this as being a bit like a normalizer to try and make sure the gradients don't get too big to try and put some sort of control on the updates. And then in here, this R, this is the rewards, this is kind of the wealth thing that we had before. So it looks quite different, I think, in terms of what we have here compared to the original sort of coin algorithm, but it's exactly the same sort of components. Um, it's just presented in a slightly different way because we're using this sort of coordinate wise version rather than this sort of like inner product sort of type version. Um, but then if you run this thing for sort of T iterations at the very end, what you'll end up with are some particles which will approximate um, your distribution at mu t. Okay? And we should hope that mu t is pretty close to pi, which is the thing that we're ultimately trying to target. Okay. And then what, okay, yeah, the one I'm going to sort of show in a moment is that you can sort of take this Wasserstein gradient to be all sorts of different things. So all sorts of different ways of calculating this Wasserstein gradient. And probably the most popular is the sort of Stein variational gradient descent approach, which we'll um, use for some of the simulations in a minute. So in terms of like, does it converge? What's the theory tell us? Well, the theory for this stuff is actually really hard, actually. Um, so we have some similar results to, well, some similar assumptions to what you have in the Euclidean setting. So we have this what, geodesically convex thing, which is a bit like the sort of convexity you have in the Euclidean setting. Uh, we assume we have these bounded gradients. And then if you assume these two things and there's some additional technical assumptions, which are in the sort of supplementary material, what you can basically show is something a bit like that Dow paper earlier on about what would be the error bound. And you have something of this form where the first term is sort of an error, error which relates to how you initialize. And the second term is messy and we can't yet get it to be cleaner at the minute, but we're still playing around so we can get it to be a bit cleaner, but you still get this kind of like root log T type thing coming in here, which is similar to what you have in the original sort of coin betting um, uh, algorithms. So the theory is a little bit, well, it's a bit hard actually. So we have to make some pretty strict assumptions to, to get this result, but we are looking at how to maybe tie this up and also how to maybe weaken some of the sort of assumptions. But the reason it's a bit challenging is because if you sort of look at the updates that you have for the algorithm, um, the way we're updating this and because we're storing and summing all these gradients and maintaining all these gradients over time, it's much harder than the much than the sort of simple uh, mapping updates that you get with, say, SVGD, because you're sort of taking your parameters, you calculate the gradient to the current iteration, and you make a move, and then you, off you go. And so it's a much simpler update. Whereas once you're storing all those things, you go and track the whole history, and that's what really makes the theory quite challenging. But there is a result that we have under some sort of strong assumptions. But in terms of how you actually implement this stuff, so like I said, there are a whole bunch of different functionals you could choose, but you would probably choose KL as being a natural choice. And then you want to take the gradient of that uh, with respect to this uh, Vashtan 2 metric. And to implement it, what you probably would try to do is something like Stein variational gradient descent. And if you go down the SVGD setting, then what you need to define then is a kernel, which is a positive semi-definite. And if we replace now this sort of gradient of this functional with this sort of kernelized gradient, then doing the, the sort of Stein identity trick where you sort of do the integration by parts, we can sort of show that if pi is proportional to this uh, e to the minus u, then this um, kernelized gradient has this sort of form, which is the expectation of this sort of Stein 
uh, I think called the Stein witness function, I think called Stein identity, I think it's perhaps the term you use. Um, so this is your kernel, these are sort of the derivatives of the kernel. Um, this is the derivative of the, your functional, your gradient of your log posterior. And you take this and you plug this in to your Wasserstein gradient algorithm. And this is what, then this is then what gives you sort of the SVGD. Um, and so when you saw that seeming that sort of animation earlier, what you were sort of seeing is that this gradient term here was sort of pushing you towards areas of higher density. But then this term here on the kernel was then kind of repelling those particles apart. And so you have to sort of like, um, you know, moving in the right direction, but then sort of giving you sort of like spread across your distribution. Um, if you don't use KL, there's a whole bunch of other stuff you could use. So in the sort of um, Anna Korber paper where she has the kernel Stein discrepancy, she replaces this uh, functional with the sort of kernel um, Stein discrepancy. And so if you do that, then you end up with a different algorithm, not coin SVGD, but coin KSSD. And or you can have coin uh, LAWGD if you do the Laplacian adjusted Wasserstein gradient descent. And there's a whole bunch of different coin versions of these things that you can create. We mostly in the paper for the sort of simulations that we have, we mostly just focused on the SVGD because it's the simplest to implement and it's probably the most popular. I'm just going to go through uh, the last five minutes or so um, some of the results that we had in the paper. So these are just some toy examples. So bivariate Gaussian mixture, donut is a funnel distribution, of course, squiggle and the Rosenbrock, which is sometimes called like a banana sort of distribution. So these are all two dimensional distributions. And um, what you can basically see is that if you look at the SVGD compared to the coin SVGD, you get very similar results. The SVGD was optimally trained uh, in certain terms of the um, learning rate. So we just ran it a whole bunch of different times and used like a grid search approach to find what was the optimal learning rate. So this is as good as SVGD will give you. And what's really nice to see is that even though we've the proof that we have relies on this quite strong assumptions, we do see that in practice, the coin SVGD does actually still do quite well, um, even when those assumptions don't hold. Um, and so the results between the two are almost indistinguishable. I don't think it's really possible to say that one's doing better than the other for this, these sorts of examples. Um, logistic regression, I mean, this the, the, the sort of text here is just sort of the background to the logistic regression, which you sort of already know. Um, the important bit really is that we're using sort of cover type data sets, so it's like what, 580,000 data points or so. And what we look at is the predictive accuracy and the negative log likelihood. And what you sort of see is that the coin method, you know, it, 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 it seems to work very well. It seems to sort of converge quite quickly. And this is because it has this sort of acceleration type um, aspect to it, perhaps compared, compared to sort of the simpler um, SVGD. You can sort of see with SVGD that if you choose different step sizes, so the optimal is sort of the blue one. If you choose the optimal one, then it will work really well. Okay, so if you look at say the negative log likelihood, you know, it converges quite nicely, not as fast as the coin thing, but the coin does have this sort of aspect of it's use, using some sort of history of its gradients to sort of know where to know where it's going, whereas SVGD doesn't have that. Um, what you do see, however, is that depending on how you choose this step size or how you choose the learning rate, you do get very different behavior. So if you choose it to be sort of too big or too small, um, you know, the behavior can be quite poor. And so having, having the ability to sort of get rid of the learning rate altogether is, is quite a nice feature. Um, this um, is sort of same, similar sort of idea, looking at the, the Bayesian neural net examples. This is the same setup that they have in the original SVGD paper. Um, yeah, you can look at the, our paper for the details of it. It's not too important, but we looked at four UCI data sets. And again, it's comparing coin versus coin SVGD. And we have a lot of plots like this in the paper. I think these, these plots really summarize exactly what we're achieving with this sort of scheme. And that is, we have the test RMSE on the sort of y-axis and on the x-axis, you have step size, okay? So what you see is that for SVGD, if you do like a grid search and you try out a whole bunch of different step sizes, you will eventually find what is the optimal step size, okay? And we're certainly not claiming that the coin method finds the optimal step size. The optimal step size, as you can sort of see here, is actually better than what the coin method gives you. And sometimes it's even more significant, but the coin is just this you know, horizontal line because there is no step size. I mean, we get, you know, you know, the, the, the test RMSE that we get is just exactly that, regardless, because we're not obviously changing step size. So I think the, the nice selling point is that we don't have to go through this whole grid search approach to try and find out what is the step size. Um, but we do show that you know, depending on how well or how, 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 how poorly you choose the step size, it can have quite a significant impact. Um, 
Last example, which I'll just quickly go through, uh, this is sort of probabilistic matrix factorization. Um, again, it's quite a standard example, I guess, that's used in the literature. So we have these ratings data sets. This is the movie lens data set that we consider. I think it's like 100,000 uh, ratings, 1,682 movies, nearly 1,000 users. And we had 10 particles when we ran this, and we used like a mini batch of 1,000. And what's really interesting, I think, about this particular example is that we have two plots. On the left-hand side, you see what happens if we run the algorithm for 1,000 iterations, and then you see what happens when you run it for sort of 2,000 iterations. So SVGD, that's your blue line. Um, the sort of green, red, um, I, I'm full of blind, so I always struggle with those two, but let's call it green, why not? Maybe it is red, not whatever. This one is SGLD, so Stochastic Gradient Laundering Dynamics, and the sort of um, hours, the gold one at the bottom here is the coin method. And again, we're sort of varying the step size. But what you can see is that when you run this thing for a thousand iterations, um, the um, uh, test RMSE that you have for coin is the same on 1,000 iterations as it is for 2,000. Whereas for the SVGD, you sort of see that if you only run this for a thousand iterations, even with the optimal step size, you're not doing as well as coin. But once you do get into those higher iterations, 2000 and, and beyond, you do start to see this is starting to come down now. And so you are starting to see that and you're having the optimal SVGD learning rate would be better than the coin sort of stuff. Okay. So just to sort of wrap up. Um, so the whole purpose of the talk is to sort of show, I guess, that these Parvi algorithms are really interesting. Um, there's a lot of interesting work going on, but and the efficiency of the algorithm will be dependent on how you choose these learning rates in the same way that it's, uh, it's going to have an impact in this sort of more traditional optimization sort of setting. Um, what we've done is we've sort of taken this idea of coin betting from convex optimization and we sort of move that over to this sort of sampling setting where you're sort of viewing sampling as an optimization type problem. One of the key things I think is that it's really simple to implement and it's really not hard to implement this coin SVGD. It's no harder than implementing um, quite a simple optimization algorithm or even just SVGD itself. The results that we have so far are a little bit restrictive, I think, um, but this is the first attempt we've had at this. And so I think with a bit more time, we might be able to try and uh, loosen some of those restrictions. So what we're thinking about at the moment in terms of future work is, well, what other sort of particle type methods could also be coinified in some sense? And can we get rid of the learning rates in other sort of algorithms that are similar to this? Um, what other betting strategies are there? So there are a lot of other betting strategies out there, um, which we're trying to learn about right now. So we people like um, Francesca Olabona, who's been working on this stuff quite a lot, this coin betting stuff in the optimization setting, there's a whole bunch of different um, betting schemes that he's uh, investigated. So we're trying to figure out which ones follow nicely into this sort of sampling setting. I mean, the KT one that we've been using actually works really well, but it's not optimal. Um, so uh, yeah, what would be the optimal one and which, which are good strategies for which problems is an interesting question that we're looking at. And then the last thing we're working on at the moment is trying to get this stuff um, implemented in the package. So we're working with some people at Blackjacks at the minute to try and get this well, SVGD and also the coin SVGD stuff um, implemented within there. So hopefully other people will be able to use it quite easily. And that's my last slide. I'll stop sharing now. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, oh, yeah, I mean, a couple, can I go first? Cool, yeah, that was great, Chris. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so I have a question about the, um, so kind of like all of the motivation was all about trying to minimize the distance between the average measure and like the best one that feels a little bit unnatural but obviously yeah. that's where you get all of your stuff from like the summation of the gradients and all that sort of thing yeah absolutely so yeah. i feel yeah i think it's unnatural as well it's yeah. really, we're, we're not happy about it um, i guess it's a short answer but it's really just building from the existing theory that's out there that allowed us to do this but yeah i don't like it either but at the minute it's what we have i'm afraid yeah, it's interesting. I guess if you did anything else, you wouldn't have the forms that you come up with with the, the previous time steps being involved in things. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it might be a case of us going back and having another look at some of the original work in the optimization literature and have a look if perhaps they've managed to find alternative ways rather than this sort of average of iterates. But the best, the best of my knowledge, they haven't. 
Um, but uh, yeah, that's definitely something we're going to be looking at further. Cool. Um, and also, so you have this like adaptive um, estimate of L or whatever yes. it ends up being in the yeah. market saying. So that's, I know like, Victor and I were looking at some Lipschitz optimization stuff um, a long time ago. Maybe he can actually remember this because I can't. But I remember it being quite important to like, do clever things when it comes to, and I can't remember if what you've got here, which is kind of the obvious thing, can mess you up. Um, yeah. But I they do loads of really complicated stuff. So like direct is the most famous of these algorithms. Yeah. Um, and there's all manner of things going on there to stop you messing up. And I'm, I can't remember what the details are, but I wondered if you thought about this at all. Yeah, that's a great question. So for that, so for some of the examples at like the logistic regression one, we know what that is. And so we just plug that in and you can just use it. We only actually started thinking about this adaptive L when it got to the Bayes neural net example, where we had to figure out something to do. So the idea of this sort of adaptive L thing is actually what they used in the coin stuff. Actually, they use the same sort of technique. And we found that it is a bit hit and miss. I mean, it generally works quite well, but then if not, then what we found instead was you do sort of L plus some constant and you choose some constant and just keep ranking that, knocking that constant up until eventually you get some stability. So it's not ideal. Um, so I think in the paper we talk about this and I think we have an like L plus 100, something arbitrary, just because that's what gave us the stability that we needed. But I guess that can, if you dramatically overestimate it, that's saying the function's much wigglier. In, in a way, and then maybe that isn't as efficient. If, yeah. Was, I, mean, I don't really know. I mean, it was only, what was interesting actually when we implemented the stuff is that it was only that Bayes neural net one, as I recall, for some data sets where it was a bit fiddly, but for everything else, it was pretty much out of the box. It just kind of worked and that was quite nice. Have you looked at the stuff they do for the Lipschitz optimizers? I remember there being some really complicated schemes, but I can't remember what they are. No, so this is on our to-do list to look at because, as you say, they're definitely smarter things we could do, but we paused it because the scheme that we were doing so far kind of worked for the examples that we had mostly, so we just sort of stuck with that for now. Sure. Yeah, I've, I've got, I did some reading on this, so I have some references somewhere I can... Yeah, yeah. if you send them to, it would be great. Cool. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, hi, uh, thanks for the talk. I, I have sort of a follow up to maybe Henry's question um, on the average on this notion of average. Um, and I guess like my question is more in general about all these coin methods. Um, but like, does it is there you, all these bounds you showed depend on like sort of the average minus like um, the the optimal um, is there is there actually any guarantee it converges in a more traditional sense like where if you run it long enough like it actually gets to the optimal or is it just some weird average ends up being optimal yeah it's just this weird average as far as I'm aware um, okay I don't think they might get beyond that I mean it's possible it's possible that you might so the betting strategy obviously have this sort of summation of the, sort of the outcomes. And it's possible if you should change that and you start looking at things like exponentially decaying weights or something, then maybe you probably would get something different out. Um, but that's not something we have a chance to explore yet. So is it, oh, oh, sorry. Um, like, uh, so... So it's possible it's just like jumping around a lot and, and it just, but like, so then how do you use that in practice? Do you just take the average of, of all the measures you've come up with or? So you can do, but we, we don't, in the end, we just take the final, uh, the, the particles of that final iteration as our approximation to the posterior. Okay. But if you wanted to say work out, say posterior averages or something, you could do like an average over the path if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. But um, we just the, the the thing we found worked best was just to take those final samples. Okay. All right. Thank you. Does convergence of like the average imply like actual convergence as well, or is, is it not as clear? clear it's not as clear as that. No. Unfortunately, it's not that clear. Is there are results in bandits where it, the kind of if you have cumulative regret bounded, you can then imply something about simple regret, and it kind of feels similar to that. Yeah, so in the yeah, so in the optimization settings, if you look at these papers for coin betting and optimization world, that's how they view it. They view it as like a minimizing regret type thing. But I don't quite I'm not sure yet if the same ideas carry over into this sort of Rashestein space sort of situation. Um, and there's not the same sort of machinery um, that we use, I think. Any other questions? If not, we're at time. So I think um, Chris said it, he could stay a few minutes longer if, uh, if anyone 
uh, as I said, and further questions. Um, I mean, if people have if people have to go and they want to contact me some other time, I can always join a call whenever next week or something. Yep. Anyone else? Quick final one. No. Okay. Great. Thanks very much for the great talk, Chris. Yep. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you.